After the past year of primarily online instruction, we are so happy to be back on campus. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the beautiful array of diversity that um, is within this first year group. We are so incredibly fortunate and happy to have such a diverse cohort. Each and every one of you represents a new possibility for a better tomorrow. This undergraduate studies, this year undergraduate studies is prioritizing our institutional core values as we work to reevaluate and rebuild what it means to be a campus community. Those institutional core values are built on the foundations of professionalism, engagement, diversity, excellence, community, communication, fairness, equity, creativity, respect, and dignity. I welcome each of you to contribute to these goals for building an even stronger MICA community and in turn, building ourselves stronger as individuals. Please know that we are here to support you today as you acclimate yourself to the campus and Baltimore and over the next four years as you build your creative foundation here at MICA. Again, welcome to our wonderful college and know that personally, my door is always open to each and every one of you. I'd like now to take just a little time to briefly describe MICA's FYE forum. MICA's forum one and two is a year long course sequence in the first year experience that shares a monthly guest lecture series for the entire freshman cohort. The curriculum has been constructed to emphasize DEIG, which means diversity, equity, inclusion, and globalization, with the three main module themes this year of identity, community, and universality. These concentrically nestled themes are grounded in self-inquiry and prioritize critically in examining our relationship from diverse and inclusive perspectives. This fall semester, we focus on honoring the teachings of our beloved uh, Fletcher Mackey, who passed away recently, and memorializing his presence by inviting Micah FYE faculty who have worked closely with him as guest speakers. We also invite our new to MICA forum faculty members to present as thriving artists, creating work within these, these main themes. A few of your other guests this semester are multidisciplinary artist educator, Cindy Chang, social change activist and director for the Office of Creative Citizenship, Abby Nyenhouse, and printmaker, painter, educator, Latoya Hobbs. Today's opening event brings two dynamic artists that I am just so excited to introduce you to. Angela N. Carroll, an artist activist, a purveyor, and an investigator of art history and culture. She's a contributing writer for Hyperallergenic, Sugar Kang Magazine, uh, Black Art in America, Black Arts, Be More Art, just to name a few and Eduardo Corral, AKA, and forgive me, Eduardo, if I mispronounce this, I'm gonna do my best. Uh, <laughs> AKA, love, uh, uh, I'm gonna mess it up. So I will actually let our Eduardo <laughs> uh, introduce his AKA to you. But anyway, he's an illustrator, interdisciplinary artist and graphic designer born in the industrial city of Monterrey, Mexico. His work is based on an ideology that sees the artist as a brand, which is, an, which is accomplished as a palpable awareness of the investigation between illustration, arts, and design creative branches. These two uh, artists are amazingly creative, 
talented, and you are in for an enormous treat today. So with that, without further ado, I will pass it along now to, I believe, um, Reb, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you guys. It has been a pleasure to speak to you today. I'm very, very excited that you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Reb? Hey everyone, um, we're actually gonna hand it right off to Angela Carroll and she'll, she'll start with her presentation. Angela, thank you so much for being here. Okay, hey everyone, uh, my name is Angela Ann Carroll and I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen. So uh, first off, really excited to be um, teaching with uh, Micah this year and uh, within Forum and uh, designing information courses. Uh, I am a writer, I'm an artist archivist, and I'll explain uh, what that means. Uh, I am also, my training in history is also in animation and film, so I dabble in those mediums as well. Um, we'll start off with a quote in a beautiful a uh, screen print by the amazing artist Lex Valdez called Lex to Positions from 2018. But within it, they quote uh, James Baldwin, where he says, the role of the artist is exactly the same as the role of the lover. If I love you, I have to make you conscious of the things you don't see. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do and have done for the last decade or so has been about uh, bringing light to artists, to writers, to creatives, to interventions that have occurred by folks who have historically been uh, situated at the margins, meaning that they are typically uh, people of color, they uh, may be queer, uh, they may or may not be American, they may or may not uh, adhere to Abrahamic uh, religions, uh, they are seen as alien, in, in all ways. And so much of my work has been to uh, form and reform and revitalize the notion of what normalcy is and to resituate our understanding about history and about art history in particular so that we don't uh, create divides that say only white histories are important and that all other histories have to be separate or elective practices. I've gotten into some very interesting trouble, uh, you know, righteous trouble, great trouble as a result of this desire to see equity within the arts and within history in, in, at large. But I look to my heroes and my patron saints, James Baldwin uh, and many others, Audre Lorde, as a kind of example that it is okay. Uh, and oftentimes when you have a kind of vitriolic response to your desire for liberation or freedom for your people and for people that you care about, that typically means you're doing a lot of great work. Uh, my early uh, history and studies uh, in and undergraduate work, uh, I studied at UMBC, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and uh, trained within animation. I had a very ambitious uh, goal at first to combine ancient studies, Africana history, art history, and animation together. I found uh, some very interesting um, concerns within the ancient studies department there and that they were very uh they only wanted to have us focus either within the greeks or the romans i i was very interested in studying all of the african civilizations that existed prior to greek and roman uh colonization and uh and so there was a lot of pushback about that largely because the professors there at the time had no understanding of those histories uh, whatsoever. And, uh, and when I said I want to study ancient Africa, they automatically said, oh, so you wanna be an Egyptologist. For anyone who has ever studied a map of Africa, we know that Egypt is one country of many, many, many countries. 
uh, in uh, in the continent, in the huge continent of Africa. And so I was very discouraged, uh, but realized that I could still use time-based media, film, experimental cinema, and animation as a way to query this notion of what history is and why history uh, is taught the way that it is. Uh, much of my uh, graduate studies, which were at the University of California at Santa Cruz, where I received my MFA in digital arts and new media with an emphasis in interdisciplinary studies uh, and mixed media uh, and uh, experimental uh, cinema studies, uh, focused on this query of what is history and why do we have so many uh, issues with trying to create equity within the uh, teaching of history and within our general understanding of history. I worked with, at the time I was doing, also very interested in language. And so I was working with spoken word artists and there was a collective of poets and performance artists on UC Santa Cruz's campus called Rainbow. And the Rainbow Collective was a collective of queer and people of color, um, artists and writers and poets and spoken word artists who were very interested in rupturing, again, these notions of time and space and history and whose stories uh, could and should be forefronted. Um, I worked, was able to work with some extraordinary poets at the time who were each from their own particular identities, thinking about and troubling what history was and what their relationship to it was. Uh, the result was a series of short films called Her Story, uh, and Her Story situated artists. Uh, one artist was uh, Japanese, one artist was Chinese, one artist was Chicana or uh, Mexican American, uh, and these each of these artists considered and thought about and queried and troubled uh, how they themselves had to understand history largely through digging through their own archives, their family archives, to figure out who they were in relationship to how America saw them, right? Uh, which was a really beautiful experiment and then through using largely After Effects um, as well as some 3D software like Maya and 3D Max and some Blender, uh, we were able to recreate these uh, dreamscapes, these landscapes to help us understand what our histories were. Um, this is a screenshot or still from uh, one, the one that was about my personal history um, called Her Story One, uh, dealing with the ways in which we feel alienated uh, even, even within our own countries, also dealing with surveillance culture and the normalization of surveillance culture against people who fight for equity and who fight for liberation. Um, when I was in California, I lived in Oakland, California for many, many years. And while there, uh, I was very interested in film and pushing uh, animation further, but it seemed that the community really needed documentary work. And so during that time, I was commissioned to do a short film for Angela, Dr. Angela Davis, who was a professor at that time within the History of Consciousness program at UC Santa Cruz. And so we did a film called Angela Y. Davis Radical Pedagogy in 2008, where I created her as a stop motion character. And um, we talked about, again, this notion of history and how even though Angela Y. Davis is a very well-known figure, as far as her image is concerned, you'll see the image of her uh, in her early 20s uh, with an Afro. That image has been turned into buttons, has been turned into t-shirts, has been turned into posters, but very few people have actually read her work, right? Have actually read her work uh, about abolition, about prison abolition, about, um, about uh, liberation uh, in the country and also around the world. Uh, and so I thought that was very interesting. And so that film queries that. I also, uh, at the time around 2010, I was living in Oakland and that is when uh, before, and this is before the wide sort of spread movement of Black Lives Matter, there was the murder of uh, Oscar Grant, who on the BART station, uh, which is similar to our Metro station here in the DMV, uh, while on the BART on New Year's Eve, uh, many, many people witnessed him being killed, shot while on the ground, unarmed, 
uh, not resisting, shot by the BART police uh, there. And there were significant uprisings, uh, significant protests that occurred after his murder, trying to understand not just his murder, but also histories of violence and histories of normalization of the murder of um, unarmed Black men, women, and migrant communities within the Bay Area. I worked on a film called Operation Small Axe, Police Terrorism and Resistance in Oakland, California, uh, that uh, traveled uh, around the nation and also internationally with uh, then Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, um, who screened it in Palestine during the time when she was, uh, at that time she was running for president, I believe years earlier um, for the Green Party. And so it was an honor to be able to have um, her recognize and see my work and share my work internationally um, with other freedom fighters and other liberation fighters across the world. I also, at that time in 2010, there was a significant uh, earthquake in Haiti or Haiti. Um, and that earthquake uh, devastated uh, many, many people. Thousands and thousands of people were left homeless, uh, many people, because many of the buildings are created out of concrete. Uh, when the earthquake came, it fell on them. And because there was not a lot of equipment to remove or be able to move large pieces of concrete from people, many people had to become amputees, have legs and arms uh, you know, uh, removed in order for them to survive. And so we arrived there to provide aid um, to give water, but also to document what was happening on the ground, because we were hearing from people that though people were giving um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to organizations like the Red Cross and others, that most must have, much of that aid was not getting to the people within Puerto Puente or outside of the region, within the more rural regions outside of the primary capital of IET. Uh, and so we went on the ground to figure out exactly what was happening uh, and were able to document that uh, within the film, uh, Haiti Rising from the Ashes in uh, 2010. Um, much of my inspiration uh, continues to be situated within film, uh, continues to be situated within radical minds who saw the impact of time-based media, of cinema, of film to create change, to create ruptures in the ways that we imagine the contemporary moment and into rupturing notions around how we can envision the future. Um, one of my favorite filmmakers of all time is Sergei Eisenstein. Um, many of you may be familiar with the battleship Potemkin from 1925. He remains a significant influence in showing me the ways in which cinema can uh, spark the imagination and can create a catalyst through which people desire to change. I am also consistently inspired by the work of Akira Kurosawa. I've seen almost everything that he has ever created. Um, I adore him. He is one of my patron saints. Um, this is a still from one of my favorite works of his uh, called the Daskaden uh, or the train and which uh, situates uh, people in their everyday lived experiences showing how they struggle to survive. Um, at this time and before understanding Kurosawa and particularly within the American context, we learn very early on to uh, segregate people and people's experiences so that we only have one uh, understanding in our imaginaries about who, who struggles and who is worthy of prospering. Um, watching international cinema helped me to expand my imagination uh, and to understand the facade that only certain populations struggle while others and only certain populations can be prosperous. I'm also um, very inspired by many of the filmmakers from the LA Rebellion. Uh, one of them in which Charles Burnett, I had the opportunity to meet some years ago, he directed a film called The Killer of Sheep, which is an extraordinary film also talking about uh, and showcasing rare exemplifications of African-American experiences uh, in the country. I'm also uh, endlessly inspired by another of my patron saints, Usman Semben, a uh, significant godfather, many of us call him, of African cinema, uh, a Senegalese filmmaker who helped to bring more conferences and awareness of African filmmakers from across 
the diaspora, including the full continent of Africa to the world stage. Uh, whereas prior to him, it was believed uh, that, uh, that African filmmakers, that Latino filmmakers uh, were neither intelligent enough nor did they have the technological sophistication in order to create a uh, dynamic cinema. Much of the filmmakers from his generation who created from a moment called third cinema uh, worked to disprove that notion and have created extraordinary bodies of work uh, to that end. Um, I will move forward with a quote from another of my patron saints. I am giving them all honor today, <laughs> Ibaye Audrey Lord. Uh, who notes in her essay, Sister Outsider, and book is Sister, Isa, Out, Sister, Sister Outsider, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situations which we seek to escape, but that piece of the oppressor which is planted deep within each of us. Um, much of my work uh, forces people to think about the ways in which they too are implicated in the subjug subjugation and oppression of those around them. What are the ways in which you other people in your communities, what are the ways in which you allow for oppressions to continue? What are the ways in which you participate in violence, uh, systemic, emotional, spiritual, uh, uh, psychological violence against people that you consider to be different from you and therefore less worthy of humanity? It is important that we do this work of querying, do this work of troubling so that we can work towards a collective liberation. Uh, if one of us is not free, none of us will be free. Um, I consider myself to be an artist archivist, which ultimately means that I am combining my writing, which oftentimes is critiques or reviews uh, into the actual uh, reference or considerations of archival, I believe that the writing provides a broader perspective about the intersections between our collective past, presence, and imagined futures. Um, it's especially important to archive, critique, and review artists who have historically been omitted from art archival, archival initiatives. Otherwise, we will not know who these artists are. This work includes uh, the collections of major art museums, critique by notable publications and recognition by art historians. I consider all of this work to be archival work um, and it is important work. Otherwise, future generations and present generations will continue to believe the lie that only certain people's histories are worthy of recognition uh, and everyone else's histories should uh, remain uh, at the margins of our understandings. Uh, I have made a conscious decision, uh, which has gotten me into a lot of, you know, righteous trouble, uh, to contribute to the scholarly archival of marginalized artists, particularly those from the African diaspora, America, Latin America, uh, and the Caribbean in particular. I have been published uh, with Umber Magazine, with, uh, as of now, Sugarcane Magazine, Be More Art, DC Theater Scene, Hyperallergic. Uh, I have some publications that will come out shortly with St. Huron, which is the publication with by uh, Solange Knowles. Um, I also have a publication of my own, a catalog that called Exploring Presence, African-American Artists in the Upper South, which represents the last three years of research that I've done to make sure that unsung African-American elder artists who are based within the DC, Maryland and Virginia region with an emphasis on DC and Baltimore um, get the recognition that they deserve. There are 10 artists in total. Uh, and they include Martha Jackson Jarvis, Joy Scott, Ed Love, Paula Whaley, Linda Day Clark, S.B. Frazier, Olitha Devane, Aziza Claudia Gibson Hunter, Schroeder Cherry, and Tom, and the late great Tom Miller. Uh, what's most dynamic about this text that we are very excited to release, which will be a limited edition print of no more than 200 copies that are signed by all of the living artists. Eight of the artists are living, two of them, Tom Miller and Ed Love have transitioned. Um, but the, the pieces are to show the significance and the prolific nature of these artists' work, who for the most part have been unrecognized largely because they did not live within or play within the confines or constructs of the art museum system as it was related to New York. Um, to be an artist of color, making work from the 70s up and really until the last 10 years, if you did not live within New York, 
it was unlikely that people would recognize your work as worthy or significant. As a result, there are large uh, populations of prolific artists, meaning that they have large, vast bodies of work who remain unsung, unknown, obscure, and largely may have uh, some of their work reviewed posthumously, meaning that many people will wait until they have transitioned or died before they will recognize their work. Obviously, this is problematic, right? We want to make sure that these artists get their flowers while they are alive. Uh, and there was a recent show in uh, at VCU called The Dirty South, which did a similar sort of survey looking at artists in the South proper um, to, say, to say that their work was relevant and worthy of exhibition and display. Likewise, I am looking at artists that are in this region, which is considered the Upper South or Up South, meaning that we are too far south of New York to be considered a city proper, but too far north to be considered the South proper. As such, we stand in a kind of liminal space that has been uh, unduly ignored. Uh, and so much of my research is working to rightly recognize these artists. This will be the first in a series of catalogs and exhibitions that rightly recognize artists that are situated within the Upper South, uh, which again is Maryland and DC adjacent artists. Uh, I uh, have, over the last few years, have received fellowships and grants uh, from significant institutions, including common, I uh, am currently a Common Field Fellow. Uh, I've received a Ruby's Artist Grant in 2020. I received a Saul Zantz Innovation Fellow Grant in 2020 as well. A small grant, an opportunity to work on a project with Q Art Foundation in 2018, um, working with the great curator, Larry Osei Mensa. Uh, who recently curated a, a show uh, with um, um, Robles, um, ah, I'm forgetting her name, right? Amber Robles Gordon, uh, that is currently at American University. Uh, at this time in 2018, I got to work with him on a beautiful exhibition by the late, recently uh, transitioned artist, Peter Williams, um, with, on the exhibition called With So Little To Be Sure Of, which was a significant work talking about histories of violence in the nation. Uh, I also, in 2018, was a, a fellow for the Day 8 Art Writing Fellowship based in, uh, in DC. Uh, again, very excited to be working and speaking and uh, collaborating uh, and plotting with students and faculty here at MICA. Um, do stay in touch with me or, or holler at me if you see me on campus. Uh, you can stay in touch with me at AngelaNCarroll.com or you can follow me on my IG at Angela underscore N underscore Carroll for more information. Uh, my book Exploring Presence again will be dropping in the next few months. So uh, look out for more uh, updates about that release as well. Angela, should I go next? Oh, yes, sorry, passing it on to Eduardo. Yeah, let's see. Um, I'm gonna share a screen. Can you all see my screen, I guess? Um, let's see. Can you hear me all right? Awesome. So I will try to go as quickly as possible, but um, okay, so hello everyone. Uh, muy buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Eduardo Corral. And uh, bueno, la razón por la que estoy hablando español es porque eh, tenemos un tema de identidad, entre otras cosas. So for whoever doesn't speak uh, Spanish, uh, my name is Eduardo Corral and uh, I'm from Mexico. And I will talk a little bit about, um, I guess, uh, my last project, and uh, I will confess that I had like the hardest time. I, I, I was like hoping to finish this like in a full uh, week of work of try to, how can I say this, I guess? 
And uh, I finally, I think, found the, the way of doing this. So my name is Eduardo Corral, and I'm gonna talk for the FYE Forum Speaker Series with the theme of identity, community, and universality. So my, uh, I guess, artistic name is uh, Tlaloc. That's the way you pronounce it, Colette. <laughs> And uh, that's the way um, I go by in the, I guess, in the art world. Um, so I am an artist, illustrator, and graphic designer. And uh, I guess I need to point out, like, uh, I guess, uh, just for everyone to like know where it is, like, uh, this is United States. Nope, it's not Monterey, California, it's with double R. So um, I, I guess I can say that it's like a two hours and 53 minutes, like, drive from uh, Texas to my hometown. No, nope, it's not. Uh, next to beautiful beaches and uh, well, five hours, 52 minutes, uh, I guess, from uh, in, in a plane uh, to Baltimore, Maryland. So um, let's see, just give me one second. Uh, so I come from a place that is called the city of the mountains. That's kind of the nickname that I have. And I want to prove that with this uh, beautiful images. And uh, I will say that um, from among the other things that, I, that my city is well known for, it might be the most carnivorous city in Mexico, that's for sure. And this is like some of the typical, I guess, uh, dishes that we have. And um, I'm gonna just like uh, give you a little bit of other weird context, maybe even unnecessary, but um, um, well, it's also, um, uh, I guess, home of this, uh, uh, the wealthiest place in, in Latin America and Mexico uh, per capita. And it's also considered to be the most Americanized like city in Mexico. So this is just some houses like on sale, they for sale in the market right now. And this is, I mean, this is, I think like uh, they're um, the real people that lives there. And it's uh, just some random covers and spreadsheet from a Monterey magazine that I found. And I just want to point out like how peculiar my Mexico I think is. So I graduated from the MFA in illustration practice program. And uh, I came here with a Fulbright. Uh, I was like very lucky to be the recipient of the Fulbright scholarship. Honestly, the only way to actually pay my tuition here at MICA. And uh, I've been a teacher for 13 years and counting and very, very happy about it. Uh, among other uh, projects, and I'm just gonna uh, show this like very quickly, like uh, very recent projects. I was the uh, artist that created the first Spotify awards. This was like made in Mexico and it's made out of silver. And, um, <laughs> Just fun fact, like in May uh, uh, 5th of 2020, it was like right before the pandemic hit. So it was the last show that I was able like, like to see, I guess, like uh, um, I'm just showing uh, the artist like just holding this. Uh, and here you can see like Baltimore, like out of my window with my, I guess I, I got some copies from the, the Spotify words that I made. So I been working like, um, I have been into 40 or plus like collective national and international exhibition. And a fifth solo exhibition. Actually, I'm uh, focusing on this particularly because Orvis Sturdius uh, is um, exactly the, the theme of my exhibition, my last show. And it's uh, my fifth solo show, but my first one in the United States. So I was very, very happy about it. Um, I've been creating this, like, uh, I guess, kind of like a highlight time lapse, like a chart where I, I, I show like people, uh, I guess, uh, some of the interesting things that have happened to me before. Uh, circa 1998 and 2000, uh, May 2021, it's uh, what we're going to focus on. And more interestingly, I'm going to talk about my passion project called El Green Project. And uh, well, long story short, or uh, El Green Project, long story short, or how uh, some stories take time. And this is going to be the first time, I think, that I'm going to go even beyond 1998, like to talk 1987, so I can talk actually about this project. <clears throat> So the concept is this, a Grim project is a multi-layer experience consisting in creating an ongoing collection of mysterious artifacts with no identifiable function or certifiable existence. Each of them provided with strangely familiar characteristics uh, mainly borrowed from the collective memory of artifacts, uh, artifacts lost in time. They are reminiscent of old appliances, tools, and forgotten contraptions. <clears throat> Basically, and that's uh, like, like, I guess the um, uh, bottom line that I reached like not too long ago, Basically, it's a project about creating nothing. That was my project. So what is this project based on? Um, so first, nostalgia. This is actually, I mean, in, I guess, like just to compare like the houses, like this is the house that I used to live back in 1987. This is my aunt's house, like a location in a part in Monterey. I was, I, I lived there from two to six years old. And I was raised by four amazing women 
my mother like and her sisters and uh, uh, her mother. So um, what shapes this project? And I'm gonna start with this uh, box. Uh, well, back when I was living here in this house, I used to have this like, uh, I guess, uh, box of toys. And I remember like used to, I used to tip over the box to scatter every single one of those contents on the floor. Uh, I remember the joy of rearranging every other, uh, everything over and over, constructing uh, different worlds and characters with a different set of rules each time. And you'll see that this permeates in my work like uh, uh, further. Uh, but um, it starts with the question, or I guess like the funny thing here is this, and I cannot see you folks, but I'm, I'm gonna make the joke anyway. Has it ever happened to you? Has it ever happened to you that you are, let's say, like uh, trying to find the, the Christmas tree or the Christmas ornaments like among boxes, like in your, I don't know, basement or something. And then suddenly you find something that you're actually, you have absolutely no clue where you're holding. And you're like, mom? What, what is this? And, and not, not your mom, not anyone knows exactly what you're holding. So that's exactly what my project is about. And uh, I'm just gonna continue quickly. These are actually my toys. I mean, some of the toys that I can remember. Uh, and um, I mean, I, I cannot see your faces, but if you're laughing of my third, like, um, I guess toy, which is like, uh, I know it's a juicer. Well, I, I'm gonna challenge you with this like notion and that is part of my whole project, which is like, um, and the other thing that is important in my project is reinterpretation. And I use this like through identifiers gathered from memory. So in that case, I mean, I think this is a very clear example of how this like, which started as a juicer, at least in my two year old, like uh, five or like a year old, like head or, or brain, it could be like perfectly like a UFO or something. So um, the funny thing, <laughs> and this is I think the, 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 the funniest thing in, in that memory is that I used to have an actual toy but back in the day, I was like, so I weirded out of what it was. I mean, like, when I was looking at it, I had like no clue whatsoever what to do with it. So it was not really a toy. It was the most mysterious artifact in my whole like cardboard box. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to like create with this project, I think is uh, the possibility to contain it in a tangible form. What do I mean by it? How can I replicate the sense of strangeness? That's, I guess, like the, I guess the, the, the base core of my project. So I guess like at some point I realized that I can give shape to the strangest object on earth. I mean, by creating one or like many weird objects. So another thing is the fascination of the unknown and the obsolescence of things. As you can see, like I can guarantee you, I can actually like bet you money that you have no clue of any of these objects that are here in the screen, where are they? And I think that's, I think that the lovely or the, the cool thing about, uh, I guess the curiosity with the unknown. Um, what else shapes my project? Secret languages and mysterious symbols of my childhood. As you can see here, um, these were like other sources of inspiration and all my life. I know right now as a graphic designer that those are logos, but back in the day, I was like so kind of weirded out or like surprised about this like weird elements that they were, I guess, in, on, on places. Actually, I'm highlighting this like salt and pepper, like uh, uh, old, very, very old, um, uh, shakers because like my my aunt used to have them and still have them if you can believe it so um, the strangest object that started all so i if i restrate is uh, i guess uh, retrace my steps this starts with this uh, particular object here that you can see on screen um i found this uh, uh, circa 1998 this is like, like a sheet of paper trying to replicate this i guess like a so-called like created weird uh, strangely weird artifacts and as you can see i was actually even like creating the logo back in the day which is a green that actually stayed it doesn't mean actually absolutely anything like coming from a spanish-speaking country but i just like like the way like the i guess the letters flow and it stay so i'm just like highlighting some of these because I want to show you that around 1998 and 2005, when I was working at the newspaper back in Monterey, uh, I was actually like when I was like working with Adobe Illustrator, I started to like put some color and, and more, I guess, identity to him. So um, as you can see, like my intention was like to make them look like plastic, some sort, and I was actually naming them with just weird names, just I guess for fun. Um, at some point, I started to develop like unique taxonomies like on them in order to control the universe, create your own rules and understand them. And in the same way you have like, I don't know, plants or animals like with like classification. I started giving classification to all these artifacts. At some point, and it was like it, one of my favorite things that happened to him is that people started asking like, where are they? So um, I guess I was just like giving the options like for people to tell me what they were. 
And I'm highlighting this one here that uh, one of my friends told me that looks like a cricket organizer. And I thought that that was genius. So yes, that's a cricket organizer for you folks. So one of the things that I noticed or um, I imagine about my project is like the autonomy that you can give to a project is what makes it universal. And uh, if I let people own it and make it grow is what can actually like make more sense about it. Like from something that doesn't make any sense like from the beginning. So if I continue, I even, <laughs> at some point created this slogan uh, with like, I guess like 50s kind of like aesthetic saying, what is it? And why do I love it so much? I mean, it almost like, like giving this like sense of like weirdness to it. Um, well, at some point I realized that after creating too many nothings, right? My idea is to create nothing. I created by consequence something. And I don't know if you're gonna get the joke like uh, some people <laughs> do if you're familiar with this, but one of the things that I realized, if you're familiar with Rick and Morty, is that I've been creating plumbuses of my life. So I'm not going to play the video, but just for the record, it's, a, it's kind of like a runny joke of an object that doesn't exist or doesn't make any sense. And I just realized that it's exactly what I've been doing since, I don't know, like the beginning of time. Um, well, then after a moment, I, I realized that there was like an accidental inspiration in my work. So I started with the strange objects, but then I started to think, what about the strange places where they live? So uh, this was like almost like an accident in former Yugoslavia forgotten monuments or the day I was introduced to brutalist architecture. Um, one of my friends was telling me like, dude, have you seen this like architecture? It kind of remind me of your objects. And as soon as I saw this one that I'm like, I guess like putting this like arrows into, I was like thinking, wait, what? Well, I've been doing brutalism all this time. So I didn't even know about it. So I thought it was the funniest thing. So I just like capitalized on that, I think. Um, this was my first like architectural like illustration that I created as a tribute to this, and I call it the Nine Colossuses. I did it in, uh, when I was here at MICA, and part of my, my thesis, or I guess part of my exploration, that was 2012. Uh, two years passed, and as soon as I was like reaching thesis, this was kind of like a more mature version that I call Las Fabricas, which was part of my thesis, just part of my thesis, because it was like so many parts of the thesis. And I call it 2014 uh, isometric law because I realized of how important isomet isometry could be for my projects. Um, as you can see, um, I was uh, the same way I was showing you this, like, I guess, logos in, in my, I guess, childhood. I started to, like, I guess, adapt the symbols to my universes just to make them more concrete. Um, at some point, I even created this, like, weird character that I call El Señor Tube, uh, which is basically like a Mr. Tube or just like a tube head person. And uh, I call it almost like, like just to, um, I guess, rationalize my, my project, almost like the, the Mickey Mouse of my Disneyland, right? So uh, at some point, like, and just, just to show you, uh, these are my notes. And, and this just like started from this, uh, I guess, um, just weird doodle that I created. And then um, I guess if I fast forward, like uh, way, way uh, afterwards, um, uh, I started like developing this character like over and over. So um, there was a, another moment here. Uh, this is after Micah. I call this the critique day. And this, I was thinking like the people that inhabit this peculiar universe. So this was my first uh, uh, time, my architectural explorations found their habitants. So strange objects, strange places, strange people, right? Now I'm highlighting this here, like uh, just for you to notice that uh, I've been creating this like uh, kind of like uh, symbols that repeats on my world, like over and over. So um, if I continue, I was like so lucky. These, these people were my heroes like back in 2000 and I don't know, before 2010. And uh, in 2016, I was so lucky the, uh, that I was able like to be on the first uh, pictoplasma uh, uh, class like that it was taking uh, place in Mexico. They used to just uh, do that in, in Berlin. But then as soon as they, they went to Mexico, I applied and I was like able to be here and it's basically like a creation of characters uh, type of, um, uh, I, I guess, a uh, institution, let, let's say. And uh, I was very happy in this, like, uh, it was like a three day, no, five day workshop. I was actually able like to make El Senor Tube like by hand. This was like, I guess my second or third, like ever done like sculpture in my life. So I thought it was very cool. And uh, I guess like this, like, like further, like this is the most refined like version of it. Uh, for whoever of all my students are like taking my FYF like class, this is the type of like approach that we think of, uh, of the, I, I guess, um, uh, um, limited edition, right? So at some point, 2017, I mean, uh, way long after I graduated from MICA, 
uh, well, not long, but like, I, I started creating this like brutalist series just to like, I guess, continue with this project or exploration of like city landscapes. And as you can see, like I started to uh, put um, El Senor Tuba in all of them, like almost like, a, I guess, just like the person that controls like the whole universe. Uh, I created this, like, I, I guess, like print, uh, four colors. And uh, this, uh, I guess, the cool thing about it is that you can actually like, rotate it in any way. And it's going to make sense, as you can see, like people walking in like different dimensions. Um, later on, and this is the most important, I think, moment. I call it the Eureka moment. Um, when I was creating this, like, uh, I guess I call it Brutalist, like three, like um, building number three, like from the inside, I realized of something. And uh, by the way, this line, line, red line here, it just means that the actual, um, I guess, image can be flipped, like, uh, I guess, upside down. And you're going to see like another universe, like upside down. So my Eureka moment was this, and please follow me on this one. <laughs> I was thinking, where have I seen this before? So, I mean, these are zoom ins from like all these characters, like kind of like, I guess, moving levers and just like pushing buttons. And I just realized how similar it was to, it, it just suddenly hit me. This is my city uh, for the record folks. Like if you see here, this is like an old foundry that is called Parque Fundidora. I mean, in, in your left, you can see like, I guess the newer version of it, but on your right, you can see like the history of it, like all this, um, I can almost, uh, or, or rust, a like, full of rust, like everything like completely destroyed or like, I guess like, uh, and, and I could see this every day when I was driving like to, uh, to my, my house. Um, these are like some historical like images like that you can actually see from this. And uh, I want you to pay attention to the first image in particular. And, and I just realized that I was like replicating this, I guess, um, just like workers like, like uh, working in this gigantic factory. So as you can see here, El Senor Tube approves and the other thing is like, I just realized like I've been like, I guess looking at like pipes and tubes like all my life, most likely that's where it come from, right? So uh, I guess the important thing here is that I realized that I've been reconstructing Monterey from memory, the Mexico I know. And I'm pointing this out because a lot of people like tell me that my work doesn't look like too Mexican. And I will say that it looks as, as Mexican as it goes. So I created, I mean, like this piece I created, uh, I guess I created this like laser engraved like images from this. A piece just just trying to create like with the light box like format to replicate the heavy glow radiating from uh, I guess the the molten uh, metal or iron and I named this two because there were I mean two pieces upside down hemisphere boreal and hemisphere austral these two names uh, come both from references from Borges and I'm going to introduce you to him in a second and Plon Uber or Visturius in particular. And as Angela, Angela was the name that you're using, like say like my, my biggest influence. So I guess my, my biggest influence uh, is not necessarily an illustrator, but it's this uh, man that I love to death, which is Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, how do you call it, Angela? Like my, well, I, I'm gonna go back to that. But uh, he was an Argentine short story writer, essayist, poet, and translator and a key figure in Spanish language and international literature. And uh, I, I cannot describe how much love I have from this man. And uh, I was revisiting like two of the, his best like seller books, uh, Ficciones and El Aleph. And uh, I realized that, that I was like almost doing something very similar, like creating universes the same way Jorge Luis Borges does. So I, I started like doing this like visual allegories. Uh, first, like thinking, you know what? I created this like hemisphere boreal, hemisphere austral, like, like I guess two uh, completely, um, uh, I guess like universes, like uh, completely separate, right? So then I was thinking, what is the what is the type of alphabet that they use? So I started creating, you know, like the way they speak or like the way they write, strange objects, strange places, strange people, strange languages. So th this is where I started to like capitalize on this. And then after a while, I was thinking, well, what if those objects can be channeled like? via, I don't know, Robert, Robert Indiana that like, you, you know, remember like big like numbers and whatnot, like what can, I mean, can I do something similar? So as you can see here are like this, uh, I guess like lamps that are like uh, basically letters or symbol that I don't even know what they are. So if I continue and uh, I um, started developing like more uh, on the concept of Jorge Luis Borges. This is La Compañía uh, and this is another allegory from short story, La Loteria de Babilonia. And uh, it's not necessarily related to like the books, but I like the idea of the company being this almost like ominous, like very aggressive, like uh, people that decide your fate. And I uh, created this like creepy looking like characters. Well, uh, February 22nd, 2018. 
Um, my father passed away and it was like uh, one of the most horrible moments that I can remember, but uh, a, a very important one, I, I think, because uh, it made me realize that uh, maybe I was approaching my whole project wrong. So uh, after a, a couple of months after my father passed away, after I didn't want to do anything, I created a piece that is called The Ruins of Future. Uh, that is uh, uh, this one here. And, and again, Channel Ison, again, my city, uh, where you can see all these people thriving. And at some point, some uh, sort of cataclysm like, like came and completely destroyed uh, the whole universe. And I want you to see that the Senor Tube is there just like sitting down uh, as the only survivor of this. Um, and uh, well, I realized that I've been doing or I've been portraying my work wrong like all the time. I mean, I, I guess I was like, I guess, um, creating it very pristine, very beautiful. And, and that was not necessarily the case. If all my project is about creating objects that are like forgotten in time, I was forgetting the forgottenness, right? So it was a sad moment, but a very important one afterwards. Uh, I went back to uh, Borges. So I created this uh, tribute directly to Borges. And this is a, an absolute like tribute because it's if you read the, the, the story, La Biblioteca Babel is exactly literal, like depiction of this, of course, with my aesthetic. Um, uh, I continue this uh, with another piece, uh, with another short story from Borges called El Sair, about this uh, character that like, I guess falls into the spell of like an object. And then he cannot think of anything else but this. And um, as you can see, like there's more grit into the, the, the projects now. And finally, this one here, Funes el Memorioso, which tells the story about this uh, guy that has like amazing memory, but after falling into a horse, like, from a horse and having a very bad like head injury, like uh, I guess like gets uh, the curse or who knows of remembering absolutely everything past and future. So uh, continuing, I, I, I wanna say something important that all these images, and this is finally where we're going, these are the images that gave shape to my last solo show. All this, uh, from all the images, I won all these awards and I was so happy to think that my illustration was like finally like being recognized. So all this uh, being like, I guess, awards that I've been awarded. And um, I'm gonna tell you the story of my last solo exhibition that took place here in Baltimore, which is called Orbis Tertius, Flyer to Janger. And uh, again, like uh, an, a, a one more like allegory or tribute to Borges. Uh, universe and uh, they actually I was so lucky like it was like the last gallery ICA Baltimore last show and uh, I, I just want to talk about like luck persistence and gratitude and uh, I will try to do this as quickly as possible but this is gallery ICA at some point when I was pitching my project like I remember like Lou Joseph and their team were looking at my work when someone I remember like I don't remember the name but someone said he should use the other space and I was saying like, what other space? For whoever knows like Gallery ICA, it's already a very big like place, but I mean, and, and this is, I, I, just, I hope this, I hope I did a good job to document like my field when I, when then they, um, I guess, uh, show me what the other space was. So this is, I will call it the portal to the uh, backspace. Sorry about that. This is the backspace. So I was looking at it and I was like, wait, wait, what? I mean, like, is, is this been all here, like here all the time? And it's been, it's, it's actually like two or three times like bigger than the actual exhibition space. Can I use this? I mean, and this phase that I'm like, like putting here is it's not a stretch, believe me. I was like feeling like that. And a couple of more uh, uh, months, like uh, I guess pass, and this uh, they show me like, they were saying like, oh, by the way, you know that we have like another like spaces. So I was like, what do you mean? like? So they have a basement, a forbidden room, I call it a forbidden room, a bowling alley. And I was like, wait, what do you mean? And this was like beyond a shock, like to see like the actual gallery was connected to this like four, five, eight, nine, I don't know, 11 times like bigger than the actual spaces that I saw. I was like completely like floored. I couldn't believe it. This is the, I call it the red and blue room. It doesn't have, it doesn't make too much sense now, but I want you to see like the texture, it was just, unreal uh, the bowling alley no I, I i can't even like say that i was almost this close to cry of like like how excited i was when i was looking at this and this comes like a very hard a breaking moment when they say oh by the way every single thing there is off limits <laughs> so i was feeling like horrible and uh, honestly i couldn't sleep i was thinking i need to use them i mean it's almost like so perfect 
So um, I said, you know what? I created this gigantic, uh, I guess, um, uh, planes of, or architecture like planes of like the whole exhibition space. And uh, I was explaining to them that I was gonna make music for every single room, uh, that, that it was gonna ha have like fog machine, that every place it was gonna have an actual scent. I mean, so it was gonna smell like something. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna do this. Let's see how it goes, believe it or not. Uh, uh, at some point, like after months, like very close to the actual exhibition, they said, you know what? Do whatever you want with the whole space. So I, I mean, this is like not a stretch. I mean, you see, like uh, they, they give me like the, the, the key of the space. Actually, I, I could see that like, I could actually make the logo that I've been recreating with the thing. And uh, I'm just gonna uh, read this very quickly. Orbis Tertius is described as a secret society of intellectuals that embarks on the colossal mission of creating a world named Tlon from the ground up. Prior to Janger, a title written in a mysterious Tlon language refers to the name of one of the numerous volumes that are part of the secret encyclopedia that holds the ex extensive contents of Tlon. The story explained that at some point, this fictional work became so vast by its incredibly rich description and documentation that suddenly many of its imaginary elements start to materialize in real life. So at the very end of the story, Tlon, a word that only existed in paper, progressively takes control of reality until it finally engulfs the world or the real world. So this is, uh, I'm just gonna say thank you uh, for, for Rodrigo Portales, which created, created the amazing wall text. Um, this uh, got over like image from the gal uh, Baltimore gallery space. This is how he is, 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 is uh, looking. So, um, so this is like, like some of the artwork that it was like, like placed at the exhibition. And as you can see, like some plants were there um, then I created, like, I was like so excited to create another language, uh, like, how, I mean, and I created all this like symbols that are actually not created, but taking, I guess, borrowed from Mesopotamian, uh, I guess, like, uh, and um, African and like uh, from all over the world. Um, at some point, Helene Choi, uh, which is an, an amazing uh, 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 teacher at MICA and graphic design and also my roommate, <laughs> like helped me like to create this like animated version of it, it was amazing. Uh, thank you, Pete Karras for Paradise Labs. Like he, he uh, helped me to create this, I guess, uh, object that you have seen in my work. And this pink one, even if I created it previously, he was able like to actually connect the tail because he was like, I guess, uh, die on, on the way uh, from Mexico to the United States. Um, and this, this, I guess, this area, I mean, I'm gonna read it for you. This immersive experience invites the viewer to dive into a world that seems to have devoured the construction of the gallery itself, even transgressing its limits its presence bleed through the, uh, to places outside the gallery, sometimes even opening portals to spaces never seen before. So uh, as you can see, like we collected a lot of trees, a lot of dead trees, by the way, they were like cutting the, the branches. So I collect them all. And uh, this place, like it, it was like welcoming you with all this, like and people were telling me like, where do you got all these trees? It was, it was amazing. Like the experience was like otherworldly. Thank you, Braulio Dominguez, for helping me to create this animated like version of this like objects in the wall that they were like projected in a big, uh, I guess, wall. And uh, what do you know? This this inflatable I created in 2014 for part of my thesis, and it was here. It was back. Um, Miguel Sutton, and I'm gonna hate this moment because I'm just gonna say it like this: He created the music for the whole exhibition. He's my hero. Every person that I was like going to the gallery was like freaking out like what is this music like the most terrifying thing he created the whole thing for every space i love him to death and uh he's a mexican jazz uh, drummer and composer so this is the red and blue room uh, and as you can see like this is the way it was looking back then uh, when people were entering here as you can see like the stairs that took you to the basement and uh, i was trying to capture like like people like reaction on the space they were freaking out and the music was like so scary and the smell so weird like uh so this is the basement i was here with people like talking and uh i guess again like being in a place that they have never seen before like it, it was unreal and like this, seeing this like gigantic inflatables like uh that there are like symbols of, of my of my uh that are like uh, all over my illustrations they were here in gigantic forms it was amazing and uh, finally like andrew andrew uh, paul keeper uh, like uh, taking photos of this bowling alley, amazing, like how it looks like so creepy. Uh, believe it or not, Salvador Amaro and I were like my friend from Mexico. He helped me to, uh, I guess, like I want to say, I was saying it would be so cool to have this character that I created, Funes. So from Mexico and from the United States, we were like doing this thing 
until like, uh, I guess uh, this was the result of the character. And um, Kirsten, Justin documenting the work. Thank you. And finally, the Forbidden Room at the basement with Nate Larson photography, creating one of the most amazing like photos I have ever had like for my work. And uh, yeah, long story short, sometimes a story takes uh, time to be told, to be patient. And thank you all. Just like to take a few moments to thank Angela and Eduardo. That was absolutely amazing. You two are amazing. And I'm so happy that this was the first iteration of the FYE forum. Um, so with that, I think we're going to close uh, the session where we went a few minutes beyond. So thank you all for sticking with us and more amazing and good things to come from FYE. Uh, again, welcome to our FYE first year experience students. We are so incredibly happy to have you here back on campus with us and um, look forward to an amazing, amazing academic year with you. So thank you all. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Hope you enjoyed today. Thank you, guys.